Okay, welcome. This is our spring youth exchange session, and we're really excited today to have um, a guest speaker, Dr. Jamie Young, who's going to be speaking to us about the impact of PFOS chemicals that we can find in our environment. So I'm happy to um, be here to share this talk with you and to have our colleague join us. But I'd like to take just a couple minutes to introduce our center just as a prelude to the work that she's going to share with us. So we're doing these youth exchange sessions, which we do record and put on YouTube to um, keep in perpetuity, but we are part of the Community Engagement Corps for the Center for the Integrative Environmental Health Sciences. And our goal is really to interface with the community. So we have in our scientific investigators at the University of Louisville at our center. We work as an interface between the, sci the scientists and community members. We try to reach out to adolescent youth audiences, healthcare providers, and then community members at large in whichever way that they come to us so that we can share information back and forth. We have a team that works together closely week to week, trying to make sure that we're staying connected to community members and really trying to address their needs that, that come to us through the, the Community Engagement Corps. So as you can see, my colleague, um, Dr. Vicki Hines-Martin is essential to us. She's very well known in the Louisville community and assists us with many community engagement, much of the community engagement work that we do. Josie Willis is our community resource coordinator who helps us stay communicating, whether it be on social media or through phone calls or op-eds. We're all working to get the information out. And then um, Sarah Jump is very essential to our work too, as she helps us with lots of the graphic design and really communicating through visuals to really help us get the message out. So we're always kind of working together as a team. Um, what do we do? We're really trying to work with scientists in different areas that concern environmental health. So, and as you might know, environmental health is a pretty big topic. It's quite widespread. So whether it be air pollution, metals in the environment, contaminants in water, in different dusts such as concrete dust, air pollution related to hemp processing, contaminants in the water such as PFOS, any, any issue of concern that a community member might bring to us, we like to rally um, the great knowledge and expertise of our scientists to help support understanding and um, building resources to, to address concerns. So I have this image here from the World Health Organization just to kind of remind us of the breadth of what environmental health really is and how it can impact us. Um, it certainly includes climate change. We have researchers that are looking at noise pollution. So it is very widespread and um, wide ranging. And so we try to do our best to tailor um, information and science to the communities that we work with. So now I'm very excited. That's just a brief overview of our center, but I'm very excited to share with you the work of Dr. Jamie Young. So um, Dr. Young is here at the Center for Integrative Environmental Health Sciences. She is recently transitioning from a postdoctoral position into a, um, an assistant professor position at the university. And we're very excited about this change um, and that she's here with us in the long run. And so she's going to share with you some of her work and interest in PFOS contamination and its connection to different communities. Um, I'll put the mic over to her now, and she can share a little bit more about herself as um, she's prepared some slides for a talk with us. So we're very excited to have her. Thank you for being here, Dr. Young. Thank you so much, Luce. I, I'm really excited to be here, and I do want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. I'm not showing a lot of work that I've done, but a little bit of background about myself and what I do and how I got here, and then also what work I want to do um, in the future. So I'm, I'm really excited to share this because it also helps me organize my thoughts and present it to a broader um, audience. So thank you again so much for having me. Sit here and share. OK, awesome. So as I mentioned, I'm going to give you some background on myself um, and how I got here and also some of the connections of PFAS with, you know, from a global perspective and then down to our community perspective and how it really is impacting Kentucky. And 
you know, when I was putting this together, I started thinking, why are you listening to me? And the first thing obvious that's obvious is the fact that this is part of the youth exchange session and part of CIHS. And so the people that are thought to be participating in this are high school students who are interested in a health career. So maybe you're here because you want to be a doctor. Maybe you're here because you want to be a scientist. Or maybe you're here because you've heard something about PFAS in the news or that there was some local discussion. You're like, hey, I think I need to learn more about that. Alternatively, maybe you saw this really cool flyer and said, hey, those colors are awesome. Oh, and maybe that title's pretty interesting. I think I'll listen in. So there's a number of reasons why you might be listening to me. But who am I? You know, I'm more than that title. So who is Jamie Young? I actually grew up in the state of Maine. I was there for almost 30 years. This is a photo of me when I think I was three or four years old, and I grew up about right here in the state of Maine. And from the very beginning, I loved nature and animals. And you can see, I hope you guys can kind of see this. From this photo right here, this is a bird, and he's got some rain boots on, and he's walking on the shore with a little lighthouse back here. But I always wore these type of shirts. These are my favorite shirts, and if I could find the shirt now, I'd wear it again. But now I I'm a, consider myself an environmental toxicologist. I'm here at the University of Louisville, and as Lou said, I am a postdoc at the moment, uh, transitioning into a faculty position. So the road from wearing these animal t-shirts as a four-year-old in the state of Maine to an environmental toxicologist in Kentucky was not uh, typical for my background or for my family. So if we start here in Maine, I was the first in my family to have gone from a high school diploma and gone beyond that and to get a higher education. So I went to yet another institute in Maine and got a BA in biology from the University of Maine at Farmington. From that point, I took some time off and I went and worked for a water and wastewater company, which when it comes to understanding PFAS, which I'll talk about more later, obviously, it helps give me a step up or a foothold into understanding some of the problems that we're having with PFAS. From there, this was also in Maine, I decided that I needed to do more and I had a bigger vision and I wanted more than running EPA tests every week and just reporting back and I needed something to really hold on to and I wanted to learn more. So I decided to come here to the University of Louisville and I received my PhD in pharmacology and toxicology in 2020. And now I'm a postdoc again and I'm in Kentucky. So being the first in my family from a low socioeconomic background, this wasn't an easy task, but I definitely learned a lot along the way and I'm excited to bring my vision to fruition. And as I said, I cons consider myself an environmental toxicologist and this job is a really, really cool job. So I can work at the bench. I've had the pleasure of being able to work with one of the largest turtles, the loggerhead sea turtle, which I actually think might be the largest. Um, the American alligator, and as you can see in this right-hand photo, also uh, whales. And in this particular um, picture, this is a humpback whale. This is the tail, and this is me looking out as the whale had gone uh, dove under the water. And we even do some work on the boat where we process the samples and culture cells from this. So I've worked with wildlife. I've worked at the bench. I've had fantastic opportunities to present at local and national and even international meetings, um, put together symposiums and working with people in the field and making some amazing networking connections. And also these um, endeavors have led to the accumulation of a number of awards. And you can see here with my family, there are um, a number of boards that have run in the family. So there's so many things as an environmental toxicologist that you get the opportunity to do. And even more recently, with the Community Engagement Corps and through the P30, I've been able to participate in this fun picture here. So we're looking at using these roly-poly pill bugs to look at metal levels around a cement factory in Louisville. And this is me down here with, I think Johnny Wise is back here. We've got Luce and Josie and um, Sarah, Calvin, John, and we are pill bugs roly-polying on the ground. So we have tons of fun as environmental toxicologists. But to really understand what an environmental toxicologist is, other than, you know, they get to work with whales and work the bench and play with pill bugs, you under, need to understand what is toxicology. And I bring this up because being from a rural area in, in Maine and being the first in my family to graduate, I don't think I heard the word toxicology until I probably became an undergraduate and until later on in my undergraduate career. 
so what is the toxic what is toxicology so toxicology is a field of science it helps us understand the harmful effects that chemical physical or biological agents can have on people animals and the environment so that's a really basic term uh, definition for toxicology it was even considered at some point calling being called the the safeology because it was the study of safety of things but it's transformed a lot over the years and if you take that into consideration then it becomes pretty apparent what a toxicologist is so the toxicologists are the scientists trained to investigate interpret and communicate the results of understanding those harmful effects on the people animals and the environment from the chemicals and the biological agents but one of the most amazing things about being a toxicologist is that you have to have an understanding of a number of different disciplines. So toxicology and being a toxicologist involves biology, genetics, math, physics, chemistry, and that's just the sciences. There's also a number of other um, careers and logistics that go into being a toxicologist. So it's really just this mashup of everything you can think of can become important in toxicology. And then we're gonna add the word environmental. So historically, the focus for a lot of research has been singularly on either people, so human health, on animal health, or on environmental or eco ecosystem health. However, it's become very apparent that all of these healths are connected into a one health, where the humans, the animals, and the ecosystem, they all share this one health, and what affects one will affect all three. And so I mentioned that there are a number of careers and uh, disciplines involved in tox being a toxicologist, but that becomes even broader when you're looking at One Health because you're bringing in economics, medicine, veterinarians. So it's a really cool study and it involves a lot of people and a lot of collaboration. Then you bring in where's the toxicology in this One Health? Well, that's where we bring in that subset of One Environmental Health in which we look at the impact of these toxic chemicals on human, wildlife, and ecosystem health. And today, we're gonna focus on one of those toxic chemicals, and that's PFAS. So you may have heard PFAS, PFOS, PFOA, there's all of these different components. Well, in a nutshell, PFAS chemicals are per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And what I've done here is you can see in red is where they kind of created the acronym of PFAS. So PFAS is that big group, and I say big group, because these are a class of over 5,000 man-made chemicals. That's right, 5,000 and man-made, not naturally occurring. However, I would say I made this slide originally four to five months ago, and since then the literature update has moved it to 9,000 chemicals or PFAS chem chemicals within the group. So imagine 9,000 of these man-made chemicals. There's a history though. What's really interesting to me is that they were accidentally discovered. So in 1938, there were these two scientists sitting in a lab and they literally accidentally discovered PFAS chemicals. And it had a really stable component to it. And therefore, by the 1940s, it was actually used in the development of the atomic bomb. By the 1950s, there were a number of properties that were discovered with PFASs, including the ability to repel oil, grease, water, and even heat. And so it was used in these Teflon pans. So the, the brand name is Teflon, and it pretty much made it so that you'll see photos of like eggs sliding right out of the pan when they're done. And so they're nonstick. And so it became a really, it became really highly used, not only in pans, but in other consumer products. By the 1960s, it was discovered it had these surfactant properties. So when you see the foam coming out of a, um, from the firefighters, you see it kind of spreads that surfactant property, that ability to spread the foam, that's as a result of PFAS being added to them. And by the 1970s, they were used in so many different industries and therefore were found in consumer products. By the 2000s, there was a global distribution and people started realizing that there are actually some health problems associated with these chemicals. And now there is a lot of public scrutiny on these chemicals. And a big part of that is the fact that at a federal level, there is actually no enforceable limit on these um, PFAS chemicals. It's considered a health advisory, so it's more of a recommendation at the federal level. And some states have started regulating it on their own. So the EPA is working. They put together a roadmap to try to figure out what the actual enforceable level will be. But right now, it's still just a health advisory. 
And so what makes these PFAS chemicals have those really unique properties that make them so high demand? That surfactant, the stability, the ability to repel so many things. Well, as a biology major and taking chemistry class, I was always taught the structure determines function, and that's absolutely the case with these chemicals. So what we have here is your typical PFAS um, chemical structure, and basically they all have this uh, floral alkyl chain here, which you have fluorines attached to carbons, and they make this long chain, and all of these different substances vary in that chain. They also vary in this group here, so that's how you get so many different kinds because it shortens the chain and adds different things to that head group. And what's the important part of this is this carbon fluorine bond. It is one of the strongest bonds in chemistry and thought to really never occur in nature. And because of that strong bond that can't be broken down, that's how it's earned its name, a forever chemical. Unfortunately, the bad here outweighs the good. So it's good that it has the ability to do these repelling forces and it's that it's stable. However, that allows it to be extremely persistent and it can't be broken down. It bioaccumulates, is found to have a number of bad health effects and it's toxic, and it can migrate really easily between water and air and within each. And because of those bad points, it has been linked to a number of negative health outcomes. So it's been linked to certain cancers and heart issues, problems with the development. So children exposed early in life have problems with learning later in life, problems with infertility and low birth weight. And that's just to name a few. So there are a lot of health outcomes that have started being associated with exposure to PFAS. And unfortunately, this isn't a new finding. It's starting back in 1956, you know, over 60 years ago, there was indication that these chemicals were going to have a negative health effect. And by 1989, one of the leading producers of PFAS or users of PFAS, 3M, found that they had cancer, high cancer rates in their workers that were related to that exposure. So this is not a new, a new problem. It just has become more apparent. And one of the movies I suggest that you watch after this is Dark Waters with Mark Ruffalo. Um, it takes place in West Virginia and it's about a lawyer who took on DuPont, which is like probably the biggest company for PFAS. Um, and it's, it's a really good movie. I'm not going to have time to show you this clip, but that clip, if you just watch that clip, that will hit home with you. Trust me. And so PFASs are found not only in industry, but in everyday products. So for example, the fast food packaging and wrappers that you have here, so McDonald's and these Subway cookies, also in pizza boxes. And unfortunately, I love popcorn and even microwave popcorn. It is found in those packages. Um, PFAS chemicals, this was a recent study done in Europe, and this was just the graphic they came up with, but they saw that in, you know, over 55% of dessert and bread wrappers had PFAS chemicals in them. And the paperboard that's used for the McDonald's french fries, so it is a lot, um, and, it's, and it's flexible everywhere, so there's a lot of movement to try to remove these chemicals from these products. It's also found in a lot of um, health and beauty care products, including shampoos and nail polishes. And in particular, on the left side, hand side of the slide, I'm showing you a study um, on eye makeup. Well, not well, all makeup, but eye makeup is one of the biggest problems or biggest um, makeup components that have PFAS in them. And so this was a study done by Miriam Diamond at the University of Toronto. She is also an environmental scientist. And when they did the study, they looked at, you know, all these products and this number of products in each of these categories and found anywhere between, um, let's just say 50, uh, 40 and 80 percent of the products tested had PFAS chemicals in them. And the problem is you can look at the ingredient list and it doesn't say PFAS on them. It actually is not going to say that not only is it not regulated, but the PFAS is coming from the other ingredients in the makeup. So it's not apparent where it's coming from, but it's there. And because of its use in so many things we use every day, it is widespread in the environment. This is a very basic picture showing you, you know, we have it in industry. It is put into the consumer products. It's a waste byproduct. It's still used in firefighting foam. And then all of that can lead to um, it being put into the environment. We're exposed to it in the air, the soil, and the water. And not just humans, but wildlife and pets as well. And today I'm gonna focus on the water component with you. And so PFAS, and that's really what we've heard a lot about in 
um, the news. And so it's a major drinking water contaminant. At the very beginning of 2021, more than 2,300 public and private water systems located in 49 states were found to be contaminated with PFAS. And by the time I put together this presentation, all 50 states had and two territories had found PFAS um, in their drinking water, and that's almost 29,000 sites, I mean 2,900 sites that it was found in. And here's just a map that the Environmental Working Group puts together, and you can see it's everywhere. And these are military sites, drinking water sites. There's so many water sites with this contamination. And in here, you can see we've got Kentucky. And so I want to bring it back home for everybody. So what does this mean in Kentucky, and what's going on here in Kentucky? Well, there's a lot of things going on, unfortunately. Um, I want to first point out here in this map, this is of 2019. Um, the uh, state went through and looked at a number of water systems, um, and the orange marks are ones in which surface and groundwater had detectable levels. The gray ones are where they were non-detectable. And what you can see compared to this little map up here in the upper right-hand corner, which was in 2016, the number of orange dots have dramatically increased compared to 2016. So over three years, I would say there was at least a 75% increase in detectability of PFAS in water systems in Kentucky. And a lot of these um, contaminant levels of PFAS are the result of industries and municipal sites. And so what this map is showing you is that you have landfills, airports, users and industries of PFAS. This is the map showing all those places that are actually just being recorded. And what you can tell here is you can't even see the outline of Kentucky anymore. We are definitely a highly industrialized um, state, and so it's not surprising that this could be a problem. And so what I want to do is kind of give you an example of where this has become a problem. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the city of Henderson, Kentucky. Um, the title of this component is uh, Recycling Gone Bad Forever Chemicals in Our Backyard. And so uh, Henderson, Kentucky is right here in this county. And this is just a picture of the bridge. You've got the Ohio River here and all these kids playing in the water and it's fantastic. And then we're going to bring in Shamrock Industries. So on that river, so right here, we've got the Ohio River. We have Shamrock Industries right down here. And so Shamrock is actually a recycler of PFAS, of Teflon. So they recycle it and repurpose it to use it for something else. In 2019, um, Shamrock actually has three sites. So let's start there. So it has three sites within Henderson, the one I showed you here, and then there's two other sites, this one, and then this one, which is closer to the high school. And at all three of these sites, um, they reported that they found PFAS in the soil and water within a, a short distance around their facilities. And so they were asked to go back in and the consultants wanted to test the soil and the water in a grid that extended 10 football fields around all three facilities. And that encompassed about 10,000 people who lived within one mile of these facilities. So it impacted definitely more than 10,000 people. And what they found is that the forever chemicals or PFAS were found in every single sample they tested. So there was some concern. The problem being is that this wasn't really relayed to the community in a way that people not only could understand it, but it just it wasn't put out there. So it wasn't until November of 2021 when an environmental reporter, uh, Ryan Van Veltzer, actually put together um, a report on PFAS in Henderson. Um, and the title being PFAS pollution could last millennia. Kentucky officials told the polluter, but not the residents. And this is the story that kind of introduced um, us, the P30 and the CIHS, the Community Engagement Court to this area. Um, the component that I want to take out of this story has led to an, a fantastic collaboration. So the part of the story where it says residents left in the dark, uh, Doughty, the local high school chemistry teacher, first heard the news from WFPL's reporting on her local NPR station. I love this part. She said, I remember driving along and just kind of halfway paying attention, and then my ears perked up. And I was like, did they say Henderson? And so what that did is I was sent this by Dr. States, um, the story, and it was sent a bunch around to some people in the community engagement court as well. And we were like, hey, what should we do about this? So. With Dr. Uh, with Luce and Josie, um, we actually contacted Ryan Van Velser, working through the Community Engagement Corps, and sat down with Coffee. So he's the reporter, and said, 
let's talk about this. You know, what what is your feel of the community? Are they are they interested in having us come out and help be involved in community engagement? You know, what's going on? So he actually connected us directly to Velvet, who is the high school chemistry teacher um, and is also on the PFAS task force for Henderson County. So an amazing connection. And we actually went out and through a citizen science community engagement approach, we visited Henderson County High School. And we also talked to a collaborator at Purdue University, Dr. Aaron Speck, who has this really cool, um, I think of, you know, space age, type of thing right here where you have like a taser where you literally point that taser at a at it at the water at the soil whatever you want you can try and it will give you a reading of fluorine and fluorine is used as a surrogate for PFAS so it's that total fluorine those little fluorines on the backbone um, so we're able to go out in the field and actually get a measurement in real time so we're going to start working with Aaron and Henderson County to come up with a way to measure PFAS and tap water and well water with the students, collect that data and then report back to the community. So we're in the process of doing this, but I, I have a vision also um, to keep working with this community and to bring in that one environmental health approach where when it comes to the human help, we might end up collecting biological samples, blood and urine and looking at PFAS and those and connecting it to maybe some health conditions in the area. We can also look at the ecosystem, maybe Canoe Creek, which actually runs between some of the facilities into the Ohio and maybe even look at rainwater. And really cool, we can maybe incorporate these little pill bugs as a sentinel species to see if those also accumulate PFAS and look at livestock and crops. And this is where I want to kind of bring it back home for me as well and give you an example of the fact that this isn't just a Kentucky problem. This also affected my hometown growing up. And I told you I was in Maine for 30 years and I think I lived in the same house for 18 years growing up. And this is my local community right here. So I grew up in Fairfield, Maine, and years or so ago there was a do not eat advisory for for deer taken in six counties. So one of the things I didn't mention is being from a low socioeconomic background and also in a very rural area, many of us depended on deer and turkey and wildlife uh, during hunting season to put meat in our freezer for the winter. Um, so this is a big deal. So they're telling you you can't eat the deer, so what are you supposed to do? So this is has a pretty big impact on the area. Um, and it's because there's a local paper mill that actually uses PFAS. And so the byproducts of the paper making process are then put out and they're kind of like a sludge and they were offered to the farmers. And so the farmers spread it on their fields um, and then the deer ate the grass that had the PFAS. So high levels are attributed in that area, probably likely due to this paper plant. And then also not very far down the road was a farm, a family owned farm in which they made all their money by the milk they sold to local stores um, from the cows. And they found really high levels of PFAS in their milk and they were no longer allowed to supply um, their product. And so it's been to become a really big problem because remediation is a concern. And then that brings me to like, what can we do? That's the biggest question I get people from Fairfield still contacting me today being like, can you come talk to our local government? Can you come talk to the city? We don't understand this. Um, so how can you reduce your exposure? There are a number of ways. I'm not going to read through these slides, but I am going to point at the title components. So one way you can do this is talk to mom and dad about getting rid of any of those Teflon nonstick pans. The other thing is if you heat these pans really high, it actually allows the fumes from PFAS to come out. So you're being exposed through the air as well. So replace that cookware and also don't use a, um, you know, a scraper or steel wool on these because then it also releases the PFAS. And this isn't a huge deal, but pop your own popcorn. I actually think it tastes better when you pop it on your own. It's hard to do when you're at work and you just want a snack or something or, you know, after school really quick. But if you pop your own popcorn, you don't have to worry about it leaching from the bag into that really yummy snack. You can also use your own containers for to go. So any of those like plastics or papers that you would use to take something really quick, those might have PFAS in them. So just order less takeout and avoid using the food packaging. Unfortunately, I'm not telling you not to floss your teeth, but you should look at this list and apparently there is a number of dental floss companies that use PFAS in their dental floss. So you may just want to consider that the next time you use floss, but floss your teeth.
And then also because of that anti um, the repellent of water, the water repellent properties of PFAS, you can start looking at some of the clothing you're wearing. If it's Gore-Tex or water resistant, you may want to consider and think about it twice. You can also have your water tested. Um, check your wildlife advisories, especially if you're eating fish or any um, wildlife meat um, to understand what's going on there and just learn more. Look up. If you have a question, figure out where, where to find the answer. And there's many people, including myself, I will give you contact information um, that can help you learn more. But one of the components, if you're talking about a, a drinking water exposure, you really want to filter your water. And that's going to be easy if you can win today's raffle. Um, this is an example of a water picture you can actually picture. You can actually see where they say that it's certified to reduce not only lead, but PFOA and PFOS, which are two of the most widely used PFAS chemicals. Um, so with that being said, uh, I want to say thank you to so many people. I had a pre-doc laboratory with Dr. Luke Kai's lab. I've worked as a postdoc with Dr. Matt Cave. Um, the WISE laboratory has been very integral as well in my success in the NeuroWISE lab. But I want to give a huge big shout out. Oops, that's not supposed to come in yet. Huge big shout out to Josie, Lou, Sarah, and Ryan and Velvet. So the Community Engagement Corps and the community at large, they have been fantastic, supportive, and I cannot wait to continue working with them. And also, so you don't think I forgot, may the fourth be with you, and tomorrow is revenge of the fifth. So with that being said, again, thank you so much.